So this unit is on fingerprints, and fingerprinting is a really fun, exciting unit, um, but can be actually quite technical in its um, development and practice. So let's learn a little bit first about the history of fingerprints. And it's kind of interesting because the Chinese had used them as a signature on documents um, over 3,000 years ago. So they've been used um, over the course of history by quite a few different people. Now, the earliest written study of fingerprints was done in 1684, and that was Dr. Nehemiah's paper. And he described the patterns that he saw on humans' hands underneath the microscope, including the presence of what we now call ridges. In 1788, Johann Mayer noticed that the arrangement of the skin ridges is never duplicated in two persons. So he's probably the first scientist that actually recognized this fact. Galton, who we've um, heard of before in our historical foundations activity, was the first person to actually study them and develop a system of classifying them. In 1892, he published a book titled Fingerprints. Scotland Yard then began um, teaching law enforcement agencies how to use fingerprints at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. Kind of interesting. Now, there are nine different fingerprint patterns, and they were first described in 1823 by um, Jan Evangelist Perkin. Sir William Herschel, in 1856, began, began the collection of fingerprints and noted that they were not altered by age, so they were the same from the time people were born um, all the way until they died. Um, and Alphonse Bertillon, um, who we've heard of before, created a way to identify criminals that was used in 1883, and what he did was he developed a method to identify them as a repeat offender. So that was collecting those fingerprints, keeping them on file, and then if somebody was, um, was caught again doing something and re-fingerprinted, then that was when the comparisons first began. Um, five years later, Galton and another gentleman named Sir Edmund Richard Henry developed the first um, fingerprint classification system that happens to still be use in the United States today. Now, in 1891, Ivan Vukatik um, improved fingerprint collection. He began to note measurements on the identification cards as well as adding all 10 fingerprint impressions. He also invented a better way of collecting the impressions. Now, here's what I want you to think about. Why, what's the purpose of adding all 10 fingerprints? Aren't they all the same? Take a moment, look at your fingers right now. Are all of your fingerprints the same, looking at even the same fingers on the same hand? Hmm. Beginning in 1896, Sir Henry mentioned um, in, the, in the previous slide, um, with the help of two colleagues created a system that divided fingerprints into groups along with notations about those individual characteristics that you could see in the patterns. So all 10 fingerprints were imprinted on a card and that's what we call the 10 card. Now that 10 card is what is used um, when people have to go to jail um, when they're, they're incarcerated for anything. But at the same time, there are a lot of professions that require people to be fingerprinted so that way they can be tracked. Um, for example, when I took my first teaching job, I left the state and um, I had my Wisconsin teaching license, but I went to Arizona and taught there for two years. When I moved back and had to renew my license, I actually had to be fingerprinted again. Anytime that you leave the state um, for a year or more and you come back, you actually have to, um, to have your fingerprints done to make sure that you didn't commit a crime in a different state. Interesting, you know that, Mrs. Learned. So, in the 1920s, federal prisons began to use them to identify their prisoners. Um, and with that, um, they had developed APHIS, or the Automated Fingerprint Identification System. So, I have a video on the webpage about APHIS. Um, it's fairly short, it's a YouTube video. Um, take a moment after our notes today and watch that video um, and, and learn a little bit about APHIS. So the other thing, or the last question I have for you here is, do your prints change? Can you change them? Can you alter them in any way, shape, or form so that way it doesn't seem that it's you? 
So we've seen all these things in, um, in movies where people have done really outrageous things to try and avoid getting caught. Um, but here's some actual cases um, from history. So what's funny is John Dillinger actually paid a doctor $5,000 to change his face and remove his fingerprints. So the doctor put acid on his fingers to try and remove those ridges. Roscoe Pitts um, hired a doctor to literally remove his fingerprints. The doctor actually grafted abdominal skin from his belly onto his fingers. The problem was, was he left palm prints and he still got caught anyways, so it didn't even matter. Um, there's one more attempt. Donald Roquier, he was a drug dealer in New Jersey who had squares of his skin in his prints cut out and turned upside down. Think about it. Did that alter the print in any way? Or is it just upside down? You can still recognize it. So, not the brightest of attempts to change his fingerprints. So, um, let's look at some specifics here. What exactly are fingerprints? Well, all of your fingers, um, your toes, your feet, your palms are covered in what we call small ridges. These ridges are arranged in connected units called dermal or friction ridges. These ridges help us get or keep our grip on objects. The natural secretions plus dirt on these surfaces leave behind an impression or a print on those objects with which we come in contact with. So an animal's external tissue or skin consists of an inner dermis and an outer dermis. Um, the creation of the fingerprints occurs in a special layer, the basal layer in the epidermis where new skin cells are produced. So fingerprints probably form by the start of the 10th pregnancy so because that basal layer grows faster than the others, it collapses in on itself and then forms those intricate shapes. So the basic shapes that we might see, the three general fingerprint distinctions, include the arch, the whirl, and the loop. So what I want you to do is I want you to take a look at the arch here. And right here you can see that the fingerprints go up, make like a hill, and then come back down. That occurs in about 5% of the population, so you're going to want to note that right there. Um, the whirl actually goes in and it makes it look like concentric circles, and we see that in about 30% of the population. Then there's what's called the loop. Now I want you to look really closely at the loop here, because the loop goes up, the ridge curves back around, and then folds in on itself. And it might be facing this direction, or it could come from this way, and then go this way. Now, this is a special area right here that we're going to talk about in the future. Um, it's called a delta. You don't have to write that down right now. I just wanted to point it out to you right here. But the loop is probably the most common um, fingerprint um, distinction. So about 65% of the population actually has a loop. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take, um, we're going to do a brief activity and just check out your fingerprints and see what kinds you have and collect some class data.